everybody. Welcome to the SHINE Conference. Uh, I'm Christina Berger. I am the Director for Nursing Research, Evidence-Based Practice, and Clinical Policy at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital down in Florida. And I would like to introduce Holly Farley, who is a Coordinator for Nursing Quality at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And she's going to be providing a lecture for us on quality improvement metrics. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce Holly and uh, hope you enjoy the topic. Hey, hey thank you, Christina. Thanks for having me and thanks everybody for joining. Um, we're gonna be really going over quality data and how you can use it to drive changes in your nursing practice. Terrific. So Holly, tell us a little bit about what we hope to learn from your presentation today. Okay, thanks, Christina. So our objectives today, what I hope you all get out of this is to understand the importance of quality, I will hope you'll be able to state struct structures that we have to support nursing quality at our organizations, how to evaluate quality improvement um, through process and outcome measures, which I'll explain more, and then how to describe the PDSA process, which can be used to improve nursing quality. Well, that's interesting. You've mentioned in these objectives that will um, understand the importance of quality. Can you expand a little bit on how Johns Hopkins nursing staff impact quality in their everyday roles? Yeah, sure. Actually, um, so my favorite quote from Edwards Deming is that quality is everyone's responsibility. So everyone in the healthcare organization can influence the quality of care that's provided and the quality of the environment that's provided. Um, it's everyone's responsibility. I love that. And professional reg registered nurses in the ANA scope of practice um, talks about how nursing can identify the expected outcomes for care, evaluate the progress towards those outcomes, contribute to quality nursing practice, which I'll give you some tangible examples of how you can do that, and then evaluate your practice in relation to these standards. So um, if I can go on to show you the, the infrastructure to support nursing quality, we have um, structure, process, and outcomes. So this is a framework uh, created by Donna Bedian back in 1966, um, and he proposed using structure, process, and outcomes to evaluate the quality of healthcare in each way. So I'll walk you through this. That's okay, mm. Christina. Yeah. How do you use structures to support nursing quality? So the structures that we may have in place at our organizations include policies, um, risk assessment tools gives us some structure to evaluating um, fall risk, whether it's the the Johns Hopkins fall risk assessment tool, Humpty Dumpty, or even pressure injury risk using a standardized tool for this. So Braden or Braden QD for our pediatrics. Also some other structures we have are CUSP teams. So if you have a comprehensive unit-based safety program on your unit, or even utilizing the lean huddle boards that a lot of us are seeing that SMS structure um, to support nursing quality, all those are examples of structures we have in place. So moving on to processes, we have processes to support nursing quality, um, which really can help us focus on improving the process by which we deliver care, which ultimately would impact patient outcomes. So for example, we have CLABC prevention bundles, which are um, processes implemented to decrease CLABC. We can measure the process of compliance with CLABC bundles by auditing documentation, observing the patient central line um, maintenance, and then reviewing performance to improve compliance if indicated. Other examples of processes are purposeful hourly rounding, um, fall prevention bundles, and indwelling catheter care to prevent CAUTI. Now, shifting over to outcome measures, we like to look at nurse sensitive indicators, which are um, outcomes associated with nursing care. So for inpatient, some inpatient measures we look at are falls and falls with injury, pressure injury, CAUTI, CLABSI. We also have ambulatory measures. We look at falls and falls with injury in our outpatient settings too, as well as patient burns and maybe extravasation as well. So interesting. Yeah. So, so what can we do like as nursing staff? I see you have this, this plan do study act on the screen. Can you kind of explain more about what that means? Um, you know, for us as nurses, I, I think probably a lot of nurses may have not ever seen this before. Yeah. So this is my favorite quick 
rapid cycle for process improvement. We have um, Plan, Do, Study, Act, which you may have heard of before, but you can um, implement a PDSA project on either the structure, process, or outcome. So just a brief overview of what PDSA is. The planning portion is where most of the time you start. You want to really identify the problem, what it is you're trying to solve. And a lot of times you can use data to um, get this information to let you know you have a problem. Um, also, once you get to what your problem is, you can plan an intervention. So um, a lot of times that's where we look at the evidence-based practices. So what's the best way of tackling this problem? Um, sometimes there, you start with an EBP project to get the best solution for your problem and then move into quality improvement, which is what this cycle is here. So once you have your plan, which is really 95% of this whole project is getting a good solid plan in place, you can then do. So this is the implementation of your action or intervention that you planned, okay? And then once that's done, you can study your outcome. So did your plan work? Did it not work? Do you have the outcomes that you wanted to have from your plan? And then once you've studied your outcomes, you can then act. So maybe you need to modify your interventions and do a new plan, um, or maybe you achieved what, your, what outcomes you wanted, so you can act to sustain the gain. Wow, that sounds like even though in four steps, that's a lot. Can you give us an example of uh, kind of what this looks like in real life? Yeah, sure. So um, here's an example, PDSA. The first thing, like we said, is the plan. So um, what I love, I love falls. I love fall prevention. I love everything falls. So I'll give you an example of falls. So falls with injury, as I said, it's a nurse sensitive indicator. There is clinical financial reputational implications. It's something that affects our magnet status and also is publicly reported to leapfrog. Um, plus it's damaging to our spirits. We don't want our patients to fall. Um, we don't want them to be injured, especially. So it's important. It's an important measure for us to be looking at. So um, at JHH, we found that we were having a lot of falls with moderate or greater injury severity. So this is some data to support why what, what we need to do, why we have a problem. And then looking at the literature, an evidence-based practice that we found is purposeful hourly rounding. It's a high effort, high impact evidence-based intervention. Um, and it's also supported by policy and patient experience guidelines. So we have lots of reasons for us to implement this. Okay. So um, to further get our plan in place, we wanted to know what was the status, what's the lay of the land for the hospital. So um, looking at what units actually perform this intervention, what units do not, will help us tailor what we want to do. Um, so we found that the majority of our units did not have purposeful hourly rounding in place. So then we looked to standardize what, what we were actually going to be doing um, to get a good plan for our patients. And then we also planned for accountability. So how would we even know that our implementation is being implemented? So we goal to have 100% of our units doing purposeful rounding. And then a process measure to see if we're actually doing that process would be audits. Um, so these audits were created by our patient experience colleagues and a group of fall champions throughout the hospital. And... Um, I will show you them soon. And then for monitoring, how would we know that what we did was successful? We would look at our outcomes. So our percent moderate or greater injury falls, we would want to see. Okay. So keeping up with the plan, um, this is how we decided we would do the implementation. So the the D is the do of this, and that's what you're actually implementing. So this is just a look at what um, elements we wanted to standardize with the purposeful hourly rounding, which would be the frequency, having the purposeful interaction. So really addressing pain, proactive toileting, positioning, personal needs for our patients, um, having all, all team members that are available, depending on your unit staffing matrix, um, engaged in the purposeful hourly rounding. And then accountability were those process measure auditing. So um, those were both implemented to measure the frequency and the quality of the staff and patient interaction. The uh, process measures that we came up with were really going in and asking the patients, are we coming in in the time that we we said we would, so the frequency. And then when we come in, are we asking you about these um, four Ps really? So it's just a quick two question audit uh, to measure what we were doing. Okay, so now we're looking into 
study. So PDSA, we're on the S piece now. So we're studying our outcomes. So there's three things that I want to look at when I'm looking at these outcomes. The first one is um, the actual implementation. So this shows by specialty area, what percentage of units implemented purposeful hourly rounding. Um, we did have a little caveat with pediatrics because they're actually teaming up with our all children's center colleagues um, to standardize what that would look like in the pediatric population. But as you can see here, all of our adult inpatient units did standardize um, this implementation. So that's one thing we wanna look at. The second thing I wanna look at is the actual process measure. So when we're looking at process measures, it's um, are we doing what we're saying we're doing basically? So like I said before, uh, we implemented these by asking the patients, our goal is to check on you frequently. Can you tell me how often our care team has checked on you? So a nice open-ended question. And then question two, when we check on you, do we consistently ask about your specific comfort and personal needs? So you can see the yellow and blue there is compliance in these questions. We, we goal to have 96% um, or above on all of these. So of the patients that were asked, 96% or more of them uh, we were compliant with. So this is a way to measure our process. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, the third aspect that I want to study is our outcomes. So the, we previously measured the implementation, then we measured the process, and now we're looking at the outcomes. So did we actually impact our percent moderate or greater injury falls, which is what we wanted to do. So this is our performance in FY20, we were at 2.96. So that's um, a little over, well, almost 3% of our falls resulted in moderate or greater injury. And then after the implementation, we looked at our falls for the fiscal year 21 performance, which was um, 2.9. So we had a 2% reduction in moderate or greater injury falls. Um, it's not statistically significant. There was no exact correlation for all of my research folks out there. Um, but this was one hospital-wide intervention that we had. We did also see um, outcomes may or may not have been associated with it, but I find it clinically significant. I like seeing that kind of decrease. Very interesting. It's, it's interesting to appreciate the difference between the process measures and the outcome measures, mm -hmm. and, and that they really are two different things that are measured carefully. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love it. And then uh, finally is our act. So when looking at our process measures, we want to know, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing 100% of the time? And that's um, that yellow blue graph we were showing. So it was pretty blue as we got further and further into it, which is what we want to see. So if yes, then we'll look at our outcomes. If no, then maybe we need to modify what we're doing a little bit and do another PDSA cycle to work on that process. And then act upon, upon the outcome measures. So if, if we are doing what we're doing 100% of the time, is it impacting our outcomes? Is it making a difference on our falls? So if yes, sustain the gain, keep it going. If no, maybe you need to modify that approach. If we're doing what we're doing 100% of the time, it's not making a difference. Maybe we need to find another intervention to implement in our next PDSA. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Holly, I think it's, it's interesting. You know, we all come from different affiliates here at Hopkins. What can a nurse do at their individual entity to, to really start to look at this and participate in improving a structure, a process, an outcome, any one of these elements, kind of where do they begin? Where do they go? What can you yeah, recommend? That's a good question. Honestly, so the first thing to do is just ask why. We're Hopkins nurses. We have a spirit of inquiry in us. That's why we're all here. Um, so ask why. Why are we doing it this way? Why does it have to be done this way? Why is this policy in place? Why do we need to do um, this process measure? Is this the best bundle? So anything that's happening, know, know that you can ask why and challenge and just get more information about what you're doing. Is it the best way? Maybe. If not, what's the best way? How do we find out? Do EVP. Okay. And then once you find your answers, participate in maybe if you're not ready to lead a quality improvement project or lead a quality improvement project. We have lots of resources here, especially with the Center for Nursing Inquiry to help you with your projects that you're doing. 
Um, Data-driven decisions, so important. Using that data to make intentional improvements, finding out what the problem is in that PDSA, really um, gearing down to that problem so you can make data-driven decisions and not just do any intervention just because you think it might work. Know that it's the best practice for that problem that you're having before implementing. And then using evidence-based practice. Ensure we're doing best practices, following them, all those process measures, the structures, policy 100% of the time. All right. Thank you so much for your attention today and enjoy the rest of your SHINE conference. Thank you, Holly. This was really informative and I love the connection between quality improvement work as well as evidence-based practice work. I think the two uh, really do coordinate together and you do need one with the other mm -hmm. to ensure that we are doing the right thing and then can be able to measure that appropriately. So thank you for sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Christina.